The topic for today is the network modernization from Sonet SDH to the packet optical future. We are hoping that you will find this an instructive and interesting use of your time. I'm sure many of you are working uh, from a similar environment to, to us, from our homes, and uh, I hope you will find that uh, this is, uh, you'll go away from today's session uh, much uh, better informed with lots of material to think about. So with that, I'd like to pass over to our technical expert, Mr. Marco Berger, who is the head of critical infrastructure vertical markets within Ribbon ECI. Marco, over to you. Okay, thank you, Simon, and thank you for all of you being with me, to, with me today. And uh, uh, this will be the first of, uh, of three sessions uh, uh, covering three different topics which are relevant uh, for the current uh, critical infrastructure market. We will talk in this session today about uh, network modernization, uh, transition migration from Sonnet as the age to a modern uh, packet optical network. And the uh, next session will be talking about the impact of uh, virtualization and cloud in the critical infrastructure market. And uh, in the third session, we will be speaking about uh, cybersecurity. So three uh, very relevant and, and actual topics to this marketplace. So let's get started. And uh, when we talk about uh, modernization, we have first to see what are the challenges that are driving uh, this modernization in the past uh, 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 several years. This is not a new process. And uh, there are several uh, reasons for that. One of them is the constant uh, uh, integration of uh, new devices uh, in the energy market. For example, we have the famous three Ds, uh, decentralization, decarbonization, and digitalization, which are driving uh, the modernization of the, of the grid. We are looking into the increased number of electrical vehicles uh, and charging stations that are being uh, added to this uh, macro system and they drive the, 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 the electricity market to better efficiency and, and more capacity. In the transport segment, we have the, the automation in place. We have uh, constantly a new cybersecurity threats and, uh, and challenges uh, uh, ahead of us. And it's not only about replacing uh, old technologies like Sonnet SDH and DDM, it's about the whole migration of this uh, marketplace to packet-based technologies. And of course, uh, integration of existing and new generation uh, systems within those, uh, within those processes. So, and uh, we have seen in a lot of places that uh, uh, there is a current a very important trend of utility companies uh, transforming into utelcos, uh, utility telecom uh, or telecommunication service providers. And this is also a very important uh, part of any modernization uh, strategy or process to take place because it will, of course, guide the, the kind of the type of technology and the type of process the company will have to pass through. And one very important point that we must take into account is that the bandwidth must grow because of the huge amount of data we are collecting from different and, and, and various uh, applications and devices, from the SCADA and the industrial IoT devices, video surveillance uh, streaming, uh, in the, uh, security applications and others. So the need for more bandwidth in the network is a, is a constant uh, a need as we see that. And in every modernization uh, process, we have some uh, pillars, some must do things that we have to take care of. Uh, the first and the top in the, of the pyramid is to lead a risk-free modernization process. So the mission critical processes and, and applications and services, they continuously run. All the, the 724 uh, services continuously are being served and any modernization should not affect uh, this reality. The second item is security. Uh, as part of all modernization processes today and in view of the different uh, uh, th uh, cybersecurity threat landscape that we have ahead of us, 
to have a tailored security according to the vulnerability assessment and, and threat uh, analysis that we have made is essential in every uh, project that we are engaged today. And in all those projects, we have to ensure that all the mission critical applications migrate smoothly or they are deployed correctly. And last but not least, uh, every customer is different one from another. So we must be able to customize the solution as much as possible, providing elasticity in terms of uh, support of different data rates and interfaces to have as much as possible a centralized control uh, state of art NMS so uh, the operator is able to reach an end-to-end -end visibility, which is one of the first steps to obtain a secure uh, network. And as typical in this critical infrastructure marketplace, we have to be able to deploy a solution that is future-proof, not only in terms of the technology that we are operating today, but also in the in support of a very extended lifespan of the network from five to 10, up to 15, and even 20 uh, and more years of, uh, of operation. So all those three aspects must be uh, looked upon when we are dealing with the modernization. So uh, starting from the assumption that uh, SDH, Sonnet, TDM are becoming end of life, okay? And they are not becoming, uh, it's a process that has going on for the past uh, several years. So we are looking at two major uh, modernization scenarios that companies are, are engaged with. And the first term that we will see, we call it IP overlay. It starts with, uh, with freezing all the investments and in deployments on the legacy Sonnet SDH network. So it remains as it is, no further expansions or, or investments are done in this network. And according to the uh, availability of uh, infrastructure, fiber, of course, or microwave systems, we deploy a all packet network that will operate in the first stage in parallel to the legacy Sonnet SDH network. So in this uh, modernization scenario, uh, all the packet-based, IP-based new services are deployed and tested and certified and validated. So it's a process that takes uh, several months to several years, and slowly and steadily, all the legacy services that are essential and are not rich in, and they are, are capable of being supported in the, port, in the in the future, are transitioned to the new network using uh, the technology that uh, transport them transparently in the packet environment, which is a circuit emulation and pseudo wire. So this is a very long pro uh, process. Uh, it can uh, takes from five up to 10 years of transition from one uh, network to another with all services, of course. And in, in this process, because of the increased surface of vulnerability that any migration to a packet network brings, we have to take care of the cybersecurity solution from a holistic point of view. So this is the first, uh, 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 modernization scenario that we that we can talk about. And the second one we called OT underlay, which is a subset of what we spoke before. But in this scenario, the first step that we take is to deploy an optical network. So this will become the, 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 the baseline and, 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 and the, 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 the infrastructure over which we will deploy all the existing and new uh, networks as we move on. So the first step uh, has before, we will freeze uh, deployments and investments in the legacy Sonnet SDH TDM uh, infrastructure. Once the optical network is in place and it, uh, it is uh, with good health and with good control and visibility, we dedicate uh, the one or two wavelengths of this network to trail the legacy SDH Sonnet into this new infrastructure. And as time passes by and we gain confidence in this infrastructure, we deploy in parallel using a new wavelength or a new lambda, an IP or a packet-based transport network. And then the process uh, uh, behaves like the IP uh, uh, overlay that we saw before. So in this uh, system, we have a, a multitask optical network uh, upon which we can run 
different uh, networks, the legacy SDH Sonnet in parallel to the new generation bucket uh, OT network. Of course, taking care of the uh, holistically uh, of the cybersecurity needs of this new infrastructure. And one of the benefits of this uh, uh, scenario is that we can monetize our network by means that we can uh, address, uh, utilize uh, spare uh, wavelengths in the optical infrastructure to address uh, a Utelco business model. Okay, of course, it depends on uh, on uh, on regulation, on licenses, but having the infrastructure in place, this is a, a natural step that then can be taken on. And as we see in this uh, uh, slide, uh, the, there are different business models for uh, uh, utility telecom service providers. So we can start with the wholesaler facilities, uh, so we can rent a uh, space, rent uh, facilities for the operator to extend their network in, 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 in areas that we are presented. And we can, with the uh, optical network, start to deploy and to, and to offer carrier of carrier services, renting a uh, wavelength to different service providers. And we can go up in the chain and uh, delivering a more advanced and, and, and multi-layer business and residential services, a full retail business model using the, this platform. And of course, as the, diff, the different business models, they increase in terms of uh, market reach, the complexity of the network increase as well, and of course, the revenues that we have to invest. But the ROI uh, is positive in all senses, regardless of the model that we selected. And we must remember that this trend is driven by, uh, I would summarize into two uh, major uh, reasons. In many countries, there is a trend uh, of the government to, to subsidize and to give incentives to utility companies to deploy uh, telecom services in order to improve uh, internet broadband services into the rural area. So this is one trend and many uh, countries and the United States is a good example for that, are, are making available huge uh, uh, funds so utility companies can make this transformation step and uh, deliver best, better services in the rural area. And the second reason is 5G. 5G, in order to fulfill all the goodies and, and, and the capabilities provided by 5G, a lot of capacity is required and the density of, uh, of uh, radio cells uh, for the 5G to fulfill its full potential must be increased significantly. So this opens an opportunity for railway companies, for energy companies, uh, regardless if they are transmission or distribution electricity companies, to help those service providers to in, uh, penetrate more markets or to become a 5G operator by itself. So those are different, uh, 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 the, the, the two main reasons why a utility must consider uh, the modernization of the network to become a utility, a telco, a utility telecommunications service provider. So let's zoom in to the different market segments and uh, let's look first of all in the addressable market of the transportation, government and power and oil gas verticals. And this uh, total addressable market is very important because it gives us a dimension of the growth of in terms of investment that, that we can expect in this market from year to year. So we're talking about an average growth year by year of eight to 9%. Uh, of course, this is data uh, previous uh, coronavirus uh, crisis. So we have to review some of the data uh, next year, but still we are talking about a significant uh, growth rate without uh, uh, considering into these values uh, investments being done in IT infrastructure or cybersecurity uh, systems or unified communication systems. So those are not included in those mar in those uh, uh, addressable market values. So we're talking about a huge opportunity, a huge market. And if we look into the smart cities uh, market, this 
market represents opportunities for all the players uh, that we can imagine of. It represents an opportunity for the electricity, gas, water uh, distribution companies to invest on telecommunications infrastructure and deploy better services uh, for this infrastructure, uh, for the system integrator, for the, for the distributor of uh, telecom or software applications to improve the value, value added proposition of those networks and of course of for us for the vendors itself and our approach for the smart cities market is very simple a smart city network infrastructure should be considered a critical infrastructure from the scratch because of all the mission critical applications that will be uh, run on top of this telecommunications infrastructure and when we talk uh, about those different verticals what is happening in the power electricity market, for example? In the power electricity market, for example, we are looking at uh, increased integration of uh, DERs, distribu uh, distributed energy resources, renewables, gas-based. We are looking at convergence of IT and OT networks, not uh, in the physical uh, 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 meaning of the com full convergence, but at this stage, at least utilizing the same uh, technologies, uh, packet-based technologies or optical technologies, and sharing some common links that we must cross uh, between IT and OT networks. In the railway market, that, that is one of our best uh, focus markets in the last years, we have seen a migration from diesel systems to electrical system to be more uh, environmental friendly. A lot of atom automation is being brought into this uh, market. <clears throat> and automation is required because one of the major goals of, the, of railways uh, today is to increase frequency of trains using the same infrastructure. And automation is one of the tools that is required to achieve this goal, maintaining the levels of safety required today. And they are looking also for replacement of Tetra and GSMR technologies for the dispatching and for the signaling that is, is uh, becoming end of life. And uh, one of the top uh, technologies being uh, uh, tested by those railway companies in Europe today is 5G. Okay, so between all those different verticals, railways will probably be the first uh, uh, utility companies deploying 5G services for the internal purpose or external purpose. In the oil, gas, uh, water market, we look for uh, uh, increased demand for more bandwidth because of two main reasons. One, data centers, because they are collecting a lot, a lot of data from video surveillance, from long uh, distances, uh, uh, pipeline sensors. And the other reason is for their workforce that is based on very remote areas. So to deliver for those guys broadband services, they must increase the, the, the capacity of the network uh, accordingly. In the defense, we are looking at real-time applications and the integration of branches, Army, Air Force, Navy, and of course, we are talking about networks with national, nation or global uh, coverage, and they are modernizing all the time, and we talked about smart cities. And all those verticals, they have some common trends and needs. All of them are engaging in some stage or another of a migration process from TDM to packet technologies. All of them are looking at uh, increased challenges in the cybersecurity arena. All of them are implementing some type of another of automation system, the smart grid, the automation for railways, the, the SCADA systems for oil gas companies. And all of them are collecting more and more and more data. And this data must be analyzed, storage, and and provide uh, an analytics so we can uh, we use this data for improve efficiency of our systems. And we are looking at the increased number of IoT, de IoT devices and industrial IoT devices being implemented, which brings a lot of complexity to an already very complex uh, environment. And we have a lot of uh, values and features uh, to respond to these requirements. 
And all that is translated into a very large customer base that Ribbon ECI have, and with a very good technical expertise that we have in, in those uh, different verticals. And we will talk about those different values and features with more details in the next slides. So, when we look into our all packet uh, offering today, we have a great value. Today we are supporting what we call the Elastic MPLS approach. It's an approach where both protocols, IP MPLS and MPLS CP, are deployed uh, simultaneously on the same platform. So we can deploy mission critical, latency sensitive, jitter sensitive applications utilizing MPLS CP, which is the technology mostly similar to what they used to work uh, uh, till today with Sonnet SDH and TDM, and also provides the, the best field results, okay? It's not by chance that MPLSTP was chosen by the, the, the by market leaders like, well, Ribbon ECI itself, but also by General Electric, Siemens, ABB, OTN, and others, okay? Including Bombardier for the railway uh, market. And we are continually support, of course, the, the plain and simple internet. It allows us uh, our platform to provide the, a full interoperability with the, the future uh, uh, ecosystem of the future substations, which will be 100% packet-based. So we know the new standards and, 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 and substation architecture being uh, studied, implemented, and, and validated today. In all of them, there is a strong presence of Ethernet for their connectivity, transforming the electromechanical relays into a packet-based network. We are continuously support our install base with the hybrid TDM and packet. Uh, unfortunately, we're not able to continuously uh, de deploy and, and offer uh, SDH and TDM because, as I told you before, this technology is becoming end of life and we are feeling it very strongly in our supply chain. And one of the good things when we take into account that the Neptune platform, the, our packet platform is a future proof platform is that the same platform will support and is supporting all the good and uh, new technologies that are being developed for the future 5G uh, backhaul market in, in, that we look ahead. For example, we have NFV platform and NFV technology available today. They are supporting NetConf Young, so we are completely interoperable with any SDN in ecosystem that will be deployed in terms of management on top of us. We have a, a holistic and a, a very flexible cybersecurity offer, and we are de deploying and developing and new protocols like, for example, Segment Route and, and Flexi, that they will have a place in the future mission critical and critical infrastructure network okay it's not now but we, we will have a place in the in, in the future so the same platform give us a, a very long uh, horizon uh, in terms of uh, uh, continuous support and investment in, in in existing and new technologies in the optical uh, domain we also have a, a, i would say a, a winning platform Winning because it's very elastic and it can comply with requirements uh, from IT networks, OT networks, and uh, UTELCO platforms as well. It's very powerful because it, it provides almost unlimited bandwidth capacity to an existing fiber optic infrastructure. It's very intelligent and, and it provides one of the interesting features that's automated fiber health management end-to-end -end with the built-in uh, OTDR uh, capabilities. So basically what it means, it means that the operator is capable of visualizing all the different networks elements that are part of this optical infrastructure and to look into different uh, uh, cuts in a precision of meters, uh, where the network is being tapped, what is the quality of the fiber optics in for the the external and internal uh, customers. And on top of that, we are very efficient in terms of latency and low power and high density. Low latency is very important because uh, uh, being deployed on mission critical networks, latency and jitter is a critical issue to be addressed. And we must, of course, uh, be able to provide low latency impact on, on all different levels of solution that we have. 
And we have a, a very flexible layer one encryption that provides a secure platform for different business models. Uh, one, to comply with the regulation in several countries, uh, the communications between substations and, and, and all, the, all the external communications of any critical infrastructure entity must be encrypted. So this solution uh, allows us to encrypt all the traffic that goes outside in the wide area network. It provides also a way to, to encrypt services for uh, critical uh, customers, for example, banks, uh, defense, government, and of course, it provides uh, both the Apollo and the Neptune, all the, dif the, dif the different platforms that we have, they are very secure uh, by nature. And it, this is a very important is issue to talk about. When we talk about security, we must look into the whole life cycle of the product line. So it's not enough for us to provide you with encryption, uh, firewalling, and other uh, uh, functionalities uh, related to data and cybersecurity. We must be able to certify that the platform itself, the network element, optical or packet, they are secure. So we are talking about the uh, common criteria certification that we have that uh, certifies that the hardware and the software that we deploy has a robust and a, and a required a security level. And we are addressing in a, in a very uh, comprehensive way best practices related to secure software development lifecycle and management. So we are trying and we are implementing uh, processes to look at security from the early uh, definition of a product through the R&D process delivery and operation, all the supply chain, okay? And when we talk about cybersecurity, uh, our strategy is very simple. We want to provide a consolidated uh, platform based on NF or virtualization or, or NFV, network functionality virtualization, and telecommunications. So basically, we have a one-stop shop for cybersecurity and telecommunications. And we are, uh, after several engagements with different types of customers, we are addressing three major threat scenarios. The first one is the, to try to deal with threats that are coming from the IT towards the OT. And an example of such a, a threat scenario happened five years or four years ago in Ukraine, where uh, hackers succeed to, to disabilitate uh, uh, for several hours uh, three uh, uh, electricity companies in Ukraine uh, penetrating their operational uh, workstation through the IT. We also are addressing the man in the middle uh, scenario with encryption in different layers, and layer one, layer two, layer three, to comply with different uh, uh, topologies and, and network requirements. And this is a, a vector that, is, uh, that compromises the, integ the integrity and the, the validation of the infrastructure because we are dealing with the operators that uh, are spread through very wide geographical areas. So we must be sure that wh who else uh, uh, taps or, or intercepts the, the different uh, medias or, 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 or gateways within our very spread, very separated network will not compromise the data, the data within. And the last and most uh, complex and challenging uh, scenario is site infiltration. So when a hacker succeeds to penetrate the already protected substation or cabinet uh, from, from this critical infrastructure uh, entity, and introduce a malware from this very uh, very sensible spot. So we are trying to address those three uh, different uh, major scenarios, and we are offering a variety of tools, starting with the SCADA anomaly detection, encryption, and secure gateways to enable us to address all those three major threat scenarios. And because it's an NFV-based platform, we can in, uh, we can add more functionalities has the threats changes and the uh, vulnerabilities increases or changes, okay? So it's a very flexible platform. And on top of that, we have from Ribbon 
a very uh, powerful portfolio for the secure unified communications requirements. So we're talking about uh, uh, unified communication as a service for the critical infrastructure enterprise as a, as a company, both for the OT and IT environments. But the same platform, the Candy, can be utilized as a communications platform for, for the, the utility service provider. So basically, we have different uh, uh, operational modes uh, that are possible with the Candy, and we can, of course, trans transform uh, this opportunity from CAPEX to OPEX very simply. And on the top of the Candy, we can add the analytics, which add uh, a better operational uh, management of the uh, unified communication systems, increase the security, which is essential to have uh, voice, data, video, uh, communications layer in the operational network uh, uh, validated, and it increases the rate of monetization of the voice and data and voice services. And in parallel to that, we can provide the traditional uh, session border controllers, uh, media gateways, uh, SIP trunking and voice over IP communications to provide an end-to-end -end unified communications uh, solution, both for the IT and for the OT. So trying to sum up uh, all the goods that we have talked about, we are uh, uh, basically providing all the tools that are necessary for a critical infrastructure uh, entity to transform itself from a state-of-art utility uh, to a layer-by-layer -layer, uh, utility telecommunications company. So all the this transformation we can, uh, we can follow on. We are addressing requirements from, for the IT uh, domain with both data, voice, and video uh, solutions. We are addressing solutions for the operational network based on optical layer two, layer one, and layer three uh, solutions. And the same infrastructure can be utilized to deploy advanced uh, telecommunication services. So we are, we are capable of, on top of the same platform, on the same systems, to allow the utility company to become a utility service provider, uh, providing 4G, 5G, backhaul services. And I, we talked before that uh, the same platform, the Neptune, the Apollo, they support advanced 5G uh, ready features that we, uh, are, are part of the current offer today, besides the, 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 the traditional solutions that we have for the OT scenario. We can deploy and provide backhaul for the business and residential services if the company would like to go into this direction. So in summary, we have an excellent solution fit. We are addressing different uh, uh, business scenarios. We are addressing requirements from the OT uh, with the, and, uh, with the Nept uh, Neptune, with the Apollo, with the Muse management solutions, cyber, uni, uni, unified communication solutions, and the third-party management. Uh, it's very important. Our management system is capable of integrating third-party, like uh, multiplexers, suites, and routers from other vendors, so we can simplify the, the, the management layer for this operator and uh, decrease the complexity of the operation of the network. We are addressing the IT requirements so we can provide a converged IT OT network and we can provide on top of that all the unified communication systems uh, both for the or corporate for the enterprise as well as uh, addressing the model of uh, Utelco uh, as well which is the last business model that we can address with the same set of equipment platforms and offering so we really have an excellent solution fit and if we summarize, I want to read all the, uh, all the different value propositions, but I will focus on the most important ones. So first of all, we have uh, a quite unique and, and very important Elastic MPLS or dual stack uh, solution for the uh, packet-based OT network. We believe that MPLS TP is the current right answer to provide the best migration option for all the latency and jitter-sensitive uh, services to a packet network, 
the IPMPLS is very important to maintain a, a unified ITOT uh, uh, transport layer. We, our management system is very similar to what is, is commonly uh, available today when the operators are used to, to deal with SDH, SONET, and TDM networks. We are complying with the utility grade protection of one to one or one to N in cases of one, one single failure or multiple failures in the network. And the truth is that with MPLSTP, we are capable of addressing uh, different network topologies and different uh, types of uh, network failures and converging all those failures within less than 50 milliseconds. Of course, we comply with the utility grade uh, sub five milliseconds end-to-end -end latency for teleprotection, protection, uh, PMUs so, or uh, phaser uh, measure units and other mission critical applications. And we have a 5G ready platform. So the same platform that we have today will support advanced new technologies. So it's much beyond 5G has a, has a mobile service. It's about the technologies that 5G is bringing to our marketplace, better timing, uh, new protocols like segment routing and flex Ethernet, uh, NFV virtualization uh, in, in much larger scale, and SDN to provide a much better automation throughout the network and interoperability between different vendors. So all those different values are, are, are being addressed by us. And on top of that, of course, a unique and advanced OT cybersecurity package. So we have a global track record. We are more than 50 years in this market. We have hundreds of uh, critical infrastructure customers in our install base. We uh, have power utilities, oil gas companies, transportation companies all over the world. And uh, I will be very pleased to continue talking with you in the, in the next sessions uh, that will follow in, in, in next week and the week after. Okay, when we talk about cloud and virtualization impacting critical infrastructure and cybersecurity in much more detail. So uh, now I pass through Simon uh, to so you can uh, we can answer some questions or doubts that uh, may have risen through the presentation. So Simon. Yes, thank you very much, Marco. I really appreciate that. And I'm sure you've given everybody on the webinar uh, some significant food for thought about uh, modernizing uh, the solid SDH networks and uh, how to reach out into the packet future. So at this point, we'd like to uh, go through some questions that, uh, that have been put. Um, and uh, if you have any further questions at the end of the presentation now, please uh, feel free to go ahead and enter them in the chat window and we will uh, we will answer them as they come up so um if i could just move to the the first uh, point we have um i have a question here in in charts four and five um marco you present two modernization scenarios uh for ot networks from sonet sdh2 to, to packet um what proportion of your customers choose each scenario and what are the main drivers that they have told you why they choose one over the other? I'm wondering if you could uh, you could uh, answer that question, please. Okay, thank you, Simon. Well, basically, uh, if we look into the sales data of uh, Ribbon ECI uh, as of today, about one third of the projects that we are dealing with are involving uh, optical devices, WDM, or DWDM systems. So they are involved in the second uh, migration or modernization scenario that we talked about. And two thirds are, are, are in the IP overlay where they are deploying a new packet network and freezing the, uh, the, the SONET SDH assets. And the, in countries like uh, China and India, for example, we still uh, see a, a lot of SDH uh, being uh, deployed as we speak today because those vendors have uh, their own components and they are still commercially and technically su uh, supporting 
uh, native uh, TDM and STH, but in the Western uh, hemisphere, the reality is, is, is different. Uh, most of the key vendors, including ourselves, are finding more and more difficult to support uh, native TDM and SDH and Sonnet. So that's why the two uh, tech, uh, migration scenarios are the ones that we are focused on, on, on for the next years. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I have, I have one further question. Um, I have a couple of more questions actually. So uh, this question is that in chart 10, you talked about the legacy support uh, using CES. Uh, what does this mean and how does it compare to the SONET and SDH it replaces in terms of management and performance? Okay, so um, uh, CES uh, it means uh, circuit emulation services and uh, pseudo wire. So those are technologies that are meant to encapsulate uh, SONET, TDM, uh, SDH. Uh, circuits and to provide uh, uh, reliable transport uh, for those services, maintaining the strict uh, synchronization required to for those uh, services uh, to operate properly. It's not meant to be a 100% replacement for those native and legacy technologies, but it provides with a very reliable uh, uh, option to transport those uh, services using a packet-based network. And uh, the results that we have seen utilizing MPLSTP on latency and jitter are very satisfactory and we are quite accepted in the industry. And we have uh, both uh, lab tests and, 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 and real field uh, deployments to prove that those results are are according to the requirements in the industry today. Okay, thank you, Marco. Um, so, so a further question I have here is: um, uh, What uh, TSOs or DSOs today are using packet technology uh, for teleprotection? Oh yes, uh, we have several cases. Uh, in most of the of the case that we are aware of, they are using MPLSTP uh, circuits to deploy uh, teleprotection and protection relays. Uh, uh, a limited number of uh, customers is utilizing IPMPLS with the RSVPTE with the advanced traffic engineering on top of IPMPLS to address this uh, application and uh, in both cases, uh, results are being achieved, but the, the levels of flexibility of MPLSTP in terms of network topology, uh, number of uh, network elements involved in, in each and every circuit is much higher than what we can achieve with the IPMPLS with the RSVPT. So basically, yes, both uh, uh, flavors of, uh, of solutions are in the market, available in the market today. We strongly recommend the utilization of MPLSTP for all mission critical applications, regardless of uh, the type of the network or type of the client. Okay, great. And we have, uh, I have a, a couple of other questions here. Um, one is a question about the equipment used for 5G networks. Um, so, so what uh, what equipment are we? Uh, using for that supports the 5G technologies. Okay, so uh, in, in terms of uh, 5G, uh, both platforms, uh, the, and the Neptune and the Apollo, they have what it takes to support 5G backhauling. Uh, in the Neptune, we have uh, the existing support of the uh, of the major protocols being utilized for 5G backhaul, which is uh, segment routing and flex Ethernet. And uh, the system is uh, capable of providing a uh, slicing, uh, complying with the three major uh, uh, slicing uh, uh, schemes required by the 5G uh, ecosystem. For example, the mobile broadband a slice or the ultra reliable low latency slice or the massive machine types communication slice which are common 
for the 5G uh, networks to address different uh, use cases. So both in the Neptune and the Apollo, we have what it takes to support backhauling and, and, and the required slicing for this uh, uh, very challenging uh, 5G ecosystem. Okay, thank you. Um, I have one, one more question. So people obviously engaging with the topics today. Um, one is, uh, is, is this uh, technology based on, now I just need to check I have this right, uh, CESO, PSN or stat -op or both? It's a combination of both, okay? Uh, basically, uh, there are different flavors of uh, 5G backhauling today in the market. Uh, uh, we have uh, different, uh, uh, let's say, implementations according uh, to different uh, market players, uh, Nokia compared to Huawei, compared to Samsung, and compared to others. So, uh, we, we, are, we, we are very holistic in this matter, so we are, we are capable of providing 5G backhaul regardless of what technology is being used on upper layers. Okay, uh, I hope that, uh, that answers the questions there. Uh, I have a couple more questions, uh, which would probably, I think it will probably take us up to the end of time, the time we've got allocated. Uh, so we have a question about, uh, uh, it's a little bit off of our electricity uh, utilities topic, but what uh, rail companies are using the packet technology for train signaling applications? Oh, definitely. Uh, good question. We have been partnering with several uh, traditional uh, railway signaling uh, companies. And uh, without mentioning the names, uh, 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 Several years ago, the, the, those companies have already migrated the, the, the very uh, tough and strict and, uh, and, and, and segregated network utilized for signaling and interlocking and uh, cross, uh, uh, level crossing management to IP. So today, uh, they are all using uh, different types of uh, Ethernet uh, applications and, and ruggedized switches with the HSR, PRP protection protocols in place and uh, they are utilizing MPLSTP for the wide wide area connectivity so the cabinets and substations are connected with the same level of reliability. So in the railway market, yes, big time Ethernet is being used and all the new uh, signaling, interlocking, uh, networks are today based on 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 layer two, layer three Ethernet uh, switching. Okay, great, thank you. And I have uh, uh, one uh, one other question here uh, regarding the elastic MPLS. Uh, how do we provide one plus one protection, and what determines uh, protection switching reversion threshold, variable delay characteristics of the signal? in case of loss of master clock and how is this detected? That sounds like quite a technical one to me, but uh, if you want to yeah, take so a stab at that. No, in, in a nutshell, we can, in terms of synchronization today, we, uh, the telecom profile called the IEEE 1588 version two has built in mechanism to address those different scenarios. So they, we can maintain a very high level of synchronization in a packet network. And when, when we talk about 5G, we talked about 5G in, in very briefly, uh, the 5G brings uh, even much uh, stricter and, and robust uh, timing and synchronization technologies into this marketplace. So we are talking about a very reliable solution in terms of synchronization. And uh, with MPLSTP, okay, and, and, and again, I will focus on this protocol because it provides a protection of one circuit to one to another circuit or one circuit to, to several other circuits in sub 50 milliseconds conversions time, uh, regardless of the topology or the congestion within the network. So those are very reliable uh, mechanisms that we have for both synchronization and uh, protection that we have in place. Okay, thank you. 
I think uh, I think that probably concludes. Let me just check again if anybody's asked any last minute. I think that's it. So I think those are all the questions that we had for today. So uh, John, I think uh, uh, unless there are any more last minute questions, then I think that we can probably wrap up and thank you for all for your attention. And we'll hope to see you on the next uh, the next session in this series. Excellent. Thank you very much, Simon. And thank you, Marco, for your presentation. And as mentioned earlier, you will receive an email with the webinar recording along with our newest white paper on utility network upgrades within the next 48 hours. And as we've mentioned a couple of times, our webinar series will continue um, June 10th with our session on the operational impact of cloud and virtualization. And it will conclude June 23rd with our discussion on cybersecurity for OTs. And you have been automatically registered for both sessions, so you do not need to take any further action. And with that, we'll conclude this webinar. Thank you very much and have a great rest of your day.